I'm Rachel Baumer, and I'm the Milwaukee Art Museum's Director of Membership. And uh, we are so thrilled to welcome you to today's Art Break with Phoenix Brown, the Milwaukee Art Museum's Abert Family Curatorial Fellow. Um, for today's presentation, Phoenix will be taking us or be talking to us about the upcoming exhibition, American Memory, Commemoration, Nostalgia, and Revision. Um, but before we begin today, I want to take a moment to say thank you to you, our members. And this thank you comes on behalf of our entire Milwaukee Art Museum team. Uh, your support both today and in the future plays such an important role in all the work that the Milwaukee Art Museum does. Um, and we are very grateful for you. And I hope you all saw the exciting email announcement yesterday that the museum will be reopening once again on March 5th. Um, of course, <laughs> I see you Lois, um, of course, with a, a special member preview day on March 4th. Um, so again, as members, you've really helped the museum weather this challenging year. Um, and your support has been truly vital in allowing us to reopen our doors once again. So thank you, thank you. Um, I also want to give a little shout out today to all of our Myad student members joining us um, for Art Break today. Um, Myad is such a wonderful partner and supporter of the Milwaukee Art Museum, and we are so thrilled to have a group of students joining us for Art Break. So welcome. Um, and then with that, I did want to share a few quick details about our program format. Um, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, um, you'll see that the chat feature is enabled below, and that is what we'll use to help answer any questions um, that you have at the end of Phoenix's presentation. Um, but feel free to add your questions throughout the presentation. You don't need to hang on to them if they come to you. Um, and then we will answer them at the end. And my colleague, Amy Kirschke, who is the museum's director of adult, docent, and school programs, um, is going to help facilitate the questions and answers. Um, and then after the Q&A, we'll have an optional discussion period. Um, Amy is gonna share a prompt for us to discuss, and we will see how big our group is for the discussion. We may use breakout rooms, but we may try to have a larger group discussion if that's possible today. Um, but either way, we hope that you'll join us for this uh, portion of the event. It's just a really nice way to, to connect with each other. Um, and then finally, I wanted to make note um, that you should watch for an email after the presentation today from Elizabeth Gasparka, um, who's the museum's development officer for membership. Um, we wanna make sure that you know about all of our upcoming programs and events. Um, so Elizabeth will be sending some details your way that we wanna make sure you mark your calendars for. Um, so with that, I think we are ready to get started. And I'm so pleased to introduce to you um, our wonderful presenter today, Phoenix Brown. Uh, Phoenix is an interdisciplinary artist and the Ebert Family Curatorial Fellow at the Milwaukee Art Museum. She holds a BFA from the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design and was a resident artist at the Yale Norfolk School of Art in 2018. Prior to joining the museum, Phoenix held internships and research positions at the Cincinnati Art Museum, Hagerty Museum of Art, and at Myad. She was a finalist for the Mary L. Knoll Fellowship in 2020 and will be a summer artist in residence at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati in mid-2021. The exhibition series American Memory is her first curatorial project and is co-organized by Brandon Rood, the Ebert Family Curator of American Art. Um, so with that, I am so pleased to hand things off to Phoenix today. Well, thanks, Rachel. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Okay, so let me pull this presentation up. Ooh, can everyone see that? Awesome. All right, let me just move everyone to the side. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's so awkward. How do I? There we go. Perfect. So, hello, and thanks for coming today to my member art break presentation. And Today I'm excited to just be presenting a preview of American Memory as well as discussing my position and my studio practice and my path since graduating from my ed. And we felt that today it would be helpful to kind of talk about more so like my experiences post undergrad for like the students that are maybe interested in pursuing like a curatorial path. And I also wanted to make note that I will be presenting some art objects they may have some graphic imagery, so viewer discretion is advised. But without further ado, let's let's get started. Okay, so like in my introduction, first and foremost, I'm an artist that uses painting and printmaking and drawing techniques to make collaged images. 
My work often describes my personal narrative, current events that are happening around the world around me and the emotions that I experience while reflecting on those events. My paintings and drawings also challenge preconceived notions of the black female body and attempts to subvert the one-way window of fantasy Western painting has long offered. After establishing my studio practice since graduating from Maya, I've continued to have this weird compulsion to keep my art historic studies and curatorial interests separated from my art making practice. But my experience with the museum, however, has opened up the possibilities of what an artist curator could look like and the different projects that I could possibly take on in the future. So I'm currently working towards uniting these practices together with the potential to develop a social practice that collaborates with institutions. So here's like a fluid graph of like my path to the museum. So when I began at the museum, I, or before I began at the museum, I interned and worked at different galleries and museums. And because I'm from out of town, I took full advantage of interning in my hometown at the Cincinnati Art Museum in conservation while I was home for the summer. And I just continued to intern like vigorously. I was kind of, I would say I was an overachiever <laughs> in school, but that's just being completely transparent. And then in 2018, I was accepted to Yale Norfolk School of Art in Norfolk, Connecticut, where I took a few credits for some studio classes. And I also made work in the art barn, like in the art barn, like just kind of beginning the practice of like having, I guess, running a professional studio because they treated us like artists there rather than students. So that was a pretty cool experience. And taking the extra credits at Norfolk provided the space in my schedule to be able to declare an art history minor and finish it all in my senior year. And I don't recommend like <laughs> declaring a minor at the last minute because I was stuck taking four art history classes and like doing liberal studies in my senior thesis all at once. So a little bit of a nightmare, but I got through it. <laughs> and eventually I graduated from Maya and at the time, as I was graduating, I was still interning at the Haggerty for in registration when I applied to be a curatorial assistant at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And after going through the interviewing process, the hiring committee determined that my curatorial interests and experiences would thrive and grow in the Aber Family Curatorial Fellowship. And the position wasn't advertised, so I was surprised when I received the offer, but that's how I ended up at the Milwaukee Art Museum. So the Aver Family Curatorial Fellowship is a position that focuses on community engagement and outreach. The initial goal for my fellowship cycle was to assist in researching, developing, and executing the Citizenship Project, which was an educational curriculum that was to aid and encourage immigrants to pass the U.S. citizenship test through the museum's historic collections. But because of COVID, we were forced to put the brakes on this project due to its need for in-person interactions and group discussions inside the museum, as well as the requirement of physical access to the objects in the gallery. Prior to and during the early days of COVID and quarantine, Brandon and I, or Brandon proposed first organizing an exhibition that zoned in on permanent, zoned in on objects in the permanent collection and activating them in an exhibition that brought in a represented narratives to the forefront. And I believe we were hoping that this exhibition would go hand in hand with the citizenship project, but once quarantine hit, we just shifted our focus to the exhibition alone. And that's how American Memory was born. American Memory, Commemoration, Nostalgia, and Revision is a three-part exhibition of drawings, paintings, and prints from the museum's collection that reveals the selective editing historical, selecting ed editing of historical narratives as it seeks to relate the true price of pursuing the American dream. And since America's founding, artists have shed light on political and social events. And though, the, though those events were well documented by many cultures, history is often taught from a single perspective. Incidents that especially evolved or impacted women, people of color, and the LGBTQIA community are either skewed or erased from history entirely. The works in American memory spanning the 19th century to present day cut through the selective editing of history to reveal the true price of pursuing the American dream. So co-curated with Brandon Rood, the American memory project was, it, what am I trying to describe? Like, it was really weird trying to organize this through COVID. And since the museum closed in March, the curatorial staff, including myself, have been working remotely from home. And I primarily co-organized this exhibition from my kitchen table and with some periodic visits to the museum on campus just for research materials. 
And I also leaned on Brandon time to time when I hit the brick, when I hit a brick wall with locating sources, text and collection images due to, the, due to my office computer not being able to like mirror on my Mac computer remotely. So technology, <laughs> but it's been a blast nonetheless. And the three chapters of American memory include people and identity, activism and terrorism and responses and revisions. Now I want to delve deeper into the individual chapters and give a preview of the objects that are, will be presented. Chapter one of American memory reflects on people who make art about their American culture and provides a platform for those who critique its identity. Portraits attempt to conceal American history while some images generously provide a glimpse into the private lives of citizens not otherwise seen in American textbooks. This exhibition chapter aims to return agency to the artist's cultural narrative while also decolonizing the history's exclusive retellings. On the right on the screen, Cephas Thompson's portraits depict siblings William and Charlotte DeWolf. Before Congress abolished the importation of slaves in 1807, the DeWolfs were an infamous slave trading family that held plantations and business interests throughout the colonies in Cuba. Cephas Thompson, an American self-taught painter, captured the portraits of the DeWolf siblings as a pair between 1804 and 1805. The presentation of both brother and sister within the rose color vignette and a blue sky with blue skies peeking in the background and with their stiff poises and fashionable in attire with also grim faces and their lips sealed. Both paintings are neutral in political character and they both omit the family's profiteering on human sex suffering within the frame. And on the left, Amy Sherrill's painting What's precious to him inside does not care to be known by the minds in which ways that diminish his presence, demands us to acknowledge the Americanness of the figure and his pride in his heritage. With ideological connections to Frederick Douglass and W.E.B. E. Du Bois, the artist channels the personal and political agency that was secured by Black people during the advent of photography by allowing the sitter to create eye contact with us and, and represent themselves how they wish to be seen Cheryl designs a spitting reflection of the first black sitters of portrait photography. The artist also says that she paints figures with gray skin to obscure the monolithic notion of black skin in a public sphere, which is often limited as a symbol of resistance and is actually a symbol of humanity. The second chapter of American memory, activism and terrorism provides a critical lens of America's codified history with colonialism, white supremacy and racial terror. The horrific scenes we understand as racial terror today is the legacy of the brutality survived by African Americans during slavery. This torrent of violence takes many forms from sharecropping to redlining to mass incarceration and microaggressions and is always met with resistance on every level. This exhibition also creates moments to imagine a more hopeful and equitable future. This chapter will include Kara Walker's entitled print depicting a bare chested white man with a noose wrapped around his neck and Walker's series of etchings published by Landfall Press reimagines grotesque open-ended scenarios rooted in race and American mythology. And Walker challenges the validity of revisionist history and holds the viewer accountable to acknowledge generations of violence, rapes, and racial terrorism experienced by enslaved and emancipated Black and African American populations. And in the middle, we have The Ascent of Ethiopia by Lois Miley Jones who expresses the ideas of the Harlem Renaissance, which encouraged artists to use African imagery and symbols as a form of spiritual uplift, linking the people of African descent with their historical past and cultural present. And in that vein, the painting's flowing lines and vibrant blues and gold suggest improvisions of realism jazz. And on the right, we have Jose Clemente Orozco's Lynched Black Men, which is an image of a mass lynching event. Burnt corpses dangle from sharp branches of leafless trees as violent and white fire rages beneath the four contorted bodies. These bodies are nameless. Their lives were slashed for having black skin. Their muscles are exposed to open air and their facial structures smashed in and erased. Orozco's works transparently document strife, realities of war and social discrimination and exploitative capitalism. But in the case of lynched black men, the artist excludes the white perpetrators of the mass execution. The print showcases racial terrorism and offers no hope for resolution. And Orozco allowed an edition of this lithograph to be a spectacle during the exhibition organized by the NAACP. He absorbed the credit of being a social justice pioneer but failed to expose the criminals who promoted death to a marginalized population. And though nowhere near all comprehensive, 
The final chapter, Responses and Revisions, returns agency to artists belonging to marginalized groups and uplifts marginalized voices such as those belonging to the Black, Latinx, and LGBTQIA communities that were either erased or swept under the rug when history was written. Works such as Paul Cadmus's The Fleet's Inn, Warrington Colescott's Primetime Histories, Lincoln Air Force Theater, and Enrique Chagoria's Modernist Cannibals holds colonizers and oppressors accountable and revises a concealed American histories. For example, on the left, Enrique Chagoya's The Adventures of the Modernist Cannibals seamlessly collages Catholic iconography, cartoons, pre-Columbian monuments, and the modern military machine to generate conversation around cultural cross-pollinization. The Adventures of the Modernist Cannibals uses familiar pop icons such as Captain America and Adelita to create deceivingly friendly entry points into the discussion of immigration, foreign policy, and colonialism. Shigoya utilizes the superhero Im image of Adelita, a mythical figure who documented the role of women as commanding officers, combatants, and camp followers during the Mexican Revolutionary War to negate stereotypes of women in the Mexican history in the Chicano community in the contemporary United States. And on the lower right, we have Colescott's print, Primetime Histories at Lincoln Ford's Theater, which commentates on the passiveness of politicians and the 1% in the wake of violence and poor infrastructure. By staging Lincoln's assassination at a striptease theater performance, he highlights the bizarre desensitization of Americans experiencing tragedy, especially if the tragedy is not occurring to them directly and immediately. And in the upper right-hand corner, Paul Cadmus's The Fleet's Inn was originally a painting commissioned by the Public Works of Art Project under the New Deal program. The painting was most notable for its candid depiction of hypersexualized naval officers and the visible co visibly coded gay interactions between the figures in the public sphere. The original painting was selected to be included in the Public Works Arts Project exhibition at the Corcoran Gallery, at, Gallery in Washington, DC. However, it was removed from public viewing before the exhibition opened in 1934. The painting was confiscated by the Navy Assistant Secretary due to its unflattering representation of naval officers it, reminded, it remained in his possession until he died in 1936. But right after the confiscation, Paul Cadmus produced limited edition etchings of, the personal, of a personal photograph of the painting. He sold the prints for $9 a piece, acknowledging that the government could not censor the painting, but they could, they could censor the painting, but they did not have the power to suppress the print. And one of these prints are in the museum's collection today. Now I want to turn our attention to a couple of object highlights in the exhibition. What I like most about American Memory is the opportunity to explore the permanent collection and rethink the historical narratives of its objects. Drawing contrast between objects continues to open up dialogues and questions about their retellings of history. These works by Glenn Ligon and Jacob Lawrence respectfully provide a clarity into the importance of marginalized groups documenting their history through the lens of their experiences. In the first chapter, People Identity, the textured language embedded in Glenn Ligon's entitled I'm an Invisible Man is easy to gloss over, but the possibility of dismissal plays into Glenn Ligon's intentions to visualize the silencing of Black voices. We perceive the Blackness of the ink before the print's text is distinguishable. Ligon's print appropriates a passage from Ralph Ellison's 1952 novel, Invisible Man. Printed on Black linen, the text Black and blotchy is obscured and difficult to discern from its dark surface. This tactile image visually highlights Ligon's and Ellison's thoughts on feeling invisible as a Black person in a white society. The viewing experience of Entitled I Am a Visible Man is comparable to viewing a burned image behind closed eyelids. The text inescapably lingers in one's line of vision, paralleling the inability of, a, inability of people of color to evade their skin color and the aggressions they face. Ligon's text-based objects often draw upon the spoken and written works of figures such as James Baldwin, Zora Neale Hurston, Gertrude Stein, and Richard Pryor. This, his interdisciplinary practice of painting and printmaking has produced bodies of work that explore the American history, literature, and society. The artist once explained that his position is to produce answers, is not to produce answers, but to produce the right questions. In comparison, Jacob Lawrence's photos claimed self-determination for Black communities by negating white monolithic narratives of Blackness. Lawrence inserts Black figures into modern achievement benchmarks through an arrangement of photographs, what may happen upon a loved one's home. The artist reinforces that Black and African-American people attaining success is not a distant fantasy, 
and the communities have the agency to create reserve spaces to celebrate themselves. Lawrence's use of pastel colors emanates the tenderness and re of recalling joyful memories, cementing Black life as a significant pillar in American history. Both works together give us an idea about erasure based on skin color and the need for private safe spaces for marginalized peoples for gathering and defining their own cultural identities. In chapter two, Activism and Terrorism, Carrie J. Marshall's lithograph, Memento, portrays a feminine figure uplifting a decorative vase filled to the brim with yellow and red blossoms. Her gaze connects with ours. She may be casting resentment towards the viewer or cautiously ushering us into a sacred or domestic space. Memento memorializes civil rights figures as angelic portrait miniatures who float within wash gray puffs of ink in the upper half of the print. Below the ink clouds, small portraits of President John F. Kennedy who put forth minimal effort to ensure racial equality, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. are enshrined in a black rectangle, suggesting the shape of an announcement board found, found during a funeral procession. Beneath their portraits, partially revealed text reads, we mourn are, leaving the memorial open-ended to whoever view, to however the viewer desires to remember the figures, either as heroes, family members, or victims. Paired with the photographer, Danny Lyons' entitled photograph, of Dr. Martin Luther King and Reverend Ralph being escorted from the courthouse to the jailhouse in Albany, in Albany, Georgia. These images bestow grace upon the historical figures and then negates the idea of martyrdom. None of these marginalized nor allied leaders intended to perish for equality or to be a symbolic victim of racial terror. They too wanted to experience a future where their humanness and the rights of their peers were realized without discrimination. They were fragile just like us, and in chapter two of American Memory, we give them their flowers. Another two works that have stood out to me during this project were made in two entirely different eras in American history. The next pair of works I want to introduce is I Want a President by Zoe Leonard and General Grant's Last Home, Drexel College, Mount McGregor, New York by George Henry Ewell from chapter three, Responses and Revisions. Yule's oil painting immortalizes Drexel College as the site of Ulysses S. Grant's last days. While living in Manhattan, battling late stage throat cancer, in debt and struggling to finish his memoir, Grant relocated his family, staff and medical team to Drexel Cottage in 1883. The air surrounding Mount McGregor was much cleaner, making life more comfortable for the controversial former president. Grant's presidency left behind a legacy of corruption and scandals, including the breaching of the Treaty of Fort Laramie, the Black Friday Gold Panic of 1869, and the abandonment of Reconstruction after the Civil War. Despite this, Ewell's painting captures the nation's nostalgia for an era past by embedding his yellow, late Victorian cottage in a warm forest vignette. The lone tree on the right side of the foreground stands before the house with a leafy trunk and naked branches near its crown. This tree could serve as a metaphor for the end of a bygone political era with the passing of Grant. In contrast, Leonard's I Want a President looks forward to a new political order that can empathetically navigate America past its oppressive heritage. Leonard's mastery of text acts for an impossibly wide range of life experience from the next president with the understanding that no president has had any of these experiences before. This not only confronts the viewer with the white monoculture of the White House, but also asks, can someone who doesn't live with oppression in America truly help those that are disenfranchised? And Leonard, she doesn't play around. She wants a president who's experienced firsthand discrimination and disaster based on racial identity, immigration status, gender, sexual orientation, physical and mental disability, rape, civil disobedience, worker strife, environmental racism, sex work, and subpart infrastructure in healthcare. Leonard suggests that the next president must be an irrefutable reflection of the people which they serve. Both objects provide a vignette of the American presidency. In these two works, we can deduce the artist's views of America and their own places in it. In Ewell's case, this painting obscures the scandals in which the president took part in with a rose-colored lens. The painting suggests Ewell yearns for a past America, and he does this by idolizing a flawed president. Leonard's print zeroes in on the socio-political landscape American leaders have long neglected. Now with changing demographics, these identities can no longer be concealed, and we can see that playing out today. A goal for American memory is to draw attention to the disparities such as this in our current country and ignite dialogues that reinterpret and challenge historical narratives that, were, that we were taught to accept and never question. 
So with American Memory, we aim to hold the Milwaukee Art Museum's collecting practices accountable by addressing how the museum acquired objects while also providing moments to dissect the monolithic narrative of American history that has been written from a single perspective. In the early phases, American Memory will be accompanied by virtual programming, including 360 tours, audio and gallery guides, expanded didactics, and online presentations and discussions by Brandon and I. And by late summer 2021, when all three chapters are open to the public, the museum is planning both in-person and virtual conversations with artists, curators, and scholars, and community leaders developed by MAMS Curator of Community Dialogue, Kentara Supron. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much, Phoenix. That was, uh, that was wonderful. It was a, a whirlwind tour of, I know it is um, a very uh, large and rich project. And so I know we'll have um, some questions as well in just a moment, but I wondered if you could say a little bit more about how are we going to experience these chapters? Will they be They'll be in the permanent collection galleries, is that right? And the first, there'll be the first chapter will appear and then the second and then the third over the course of the summer. I don't know that everything's finalized, but I guess if you wanted to say a little bit more about how we'll come across the works in the galleries. Yeah, so they're going to have like a staggered opening schedule. So they'll overlap, but all three will be open at once, like towards the end of the season, end of the summer. But the galleries will be on different floors. So like, as you navigate the museum, you'll come across the exhibitions and I'm sure we'll have some sort of navigation so people can locate them if they wanted to go visit the exhibition directly rather than just kind of passing through or just happen to like come across it. But we hope it'll be like an interesting like intervention in between the different galleries and the museum. I was going to say that's such an exciting part of this project is that we'll come across it in, in different sections and it um, it doesn't feel so like um, bookended, you know, like a real clear start and finish. It's sort of infused throughout the galleries. Exactly. Um, so we do have a question on lots of uh, gratitude coming in, but a question on what surprised you when putting together this exhibition and how did you select works to pair together? What surprised me? Well, I guess what surprised me most was like, I think I was, you know what? I think I'll say I was surprised that the museum doesn't have a whole lot of work by Carrie James Marshall. I will say that. <laughs> but I was also surprised on how expansive the American art collection is and how like how many contemporary artists we do have in the collection. And was the second part about like how we pick the works in the exhibition? Sort of how you paired things, yeah. Super. Oh yeah, paired things. So we basically paired it on the sense of like, is the work like, is this a work by artists that are critiquing America and its social structure? We put artists that kind of went that route and put them in a group. And then we put artists who critique like American history such as Kara Walker and like Antebellum South and like slavery. So we put works that are similar in that vein together. And then we also put works in another group where artists artists critique the American identity or they kind of conceal the identity like Cephas Thompson's portraits. We put those all in a group together. Nice, and all from your kitchen table. I love that you described curating <laughs> from your kitchen table in this time of COVID. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, let's, see, uh, let's see. Could you talk a little bit more about how you approach curation? I know I'm personally really interested in that as well. Um, sort of this artist curator um, combination that you bring. And then how do you frame these works within a curatorial narrative? So that's another two part question. Okay. So my curatorial process, which I am still developing, I will say that. I think I began with just being a fangirl of like artists that I really, really like and I really want to include and I really want to learn more about. So I kind of come from that standpoint as like someone who wants to learn more about something that I don't know a whole lot about. And also coming to the museum, I really didn't know what was already in the collection. So the first couple of months of being here, I had to like kind of play catch up just to figure out what's already available to us. And what was the second half of the question? How do you frame these works within a curatorial narrative? Hmm. How I frame them within a curatorial narrative? I don't know, that question's kind of difficult to answer. Like the curator curatorial narrative as in like the exhibition and how do we put them together? 
Yeah, I think that is, it's a question open for interpretation. Frame is in quotes, so. Hmm. We might be able to come back to that too. If yeah, I'm not super sure how to answer that. That's a good question. Okay. Why don't we, we'll go with a couple others here and then we can maybe come back to that if the person also wants to expand on their um, question. So um, then also what kinds of events are being planned? I know you mentioned um, some things in your slide, but can you talk a little bit more about the events or programs being planned around the exhibition over the summer? Yeah, so nothing's really set in stone yet, but we're considering inviting like curators and artists to come together and to have a discussion about the museum. Not the, well, I guess the museum, but also the exhibition. And maybe it'll be based on like a, like a topic or like an idea from the exhibition. We're still kind of working out the kinks with that, but that's what we hope. And that's what I'm really excited about is inviting people I've always wanted to like talk to <laughs> more expansively about art history. And we'll definitely have some tours. I believe me and Brandon are probably going to record some tours for online for virtual purposes. And I think just more things in that vein and more like, or I guess we're also hoping to have some more didactics where like we allow people to have reading material through the museum, not the museum, but the exhibition. So like American memory just doesn't like die after <laughs> you leave the exhibition, you'll continue to remember it. And also hopefully just like a, to cultivate like a moment of embrace for people to realize that history has many facets and it's not just this one single narrative this from this one perspective. Thanks. Thank you so much. So through this work and the idea of artists critiquing America, how do you feel your curatorial practice can critique America and the very historically white centered museum field? Mm, or simple no. question for you. <laughs> yeah, that's another big question. That's like <laughs> an essay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not super sure if I can answer that either quite yet because I'm still kind of navigating my own curatorial practice and getting comfortable with what I like to research. But I definitely think the American memory is a start to beginning to dismantle that idea of like whiteness is the center of history. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so Lois asked, what are three, the three most important ways you feel you've developed personally as an artist curator um, through this project so far at MAM? And what are, you, are some of your personal takeaways if you feel comfortable sharing? Oh yeah, let's see, my three biggest takeaways. I would say maybe the first one is like sitting down and researching because my brain goes like 3000 miles a minute and I'm so used to just making things and then like researching it later to make sure everything makes sense. Whereas this is like the reverse process where I have to research and then put things together. So I think I've learned some, I guess some tactics to like write on the fly and like research things. And another one, I think also memorization that seems very like <laughs> bare bones or like not very like high up on like priority or anything, but like just remembering artists and all the works that they make and just kind of taking their own historical narrative and putting it like up against the historical, the history of America. So just making like connections and parallels between artists and how they all interweave throughout history. I think that's something that I learned to like do and able to like dissect. And I'm not sure I have a, if I have a third one. I'm still kind of in the learning experience and the, I guess the absorption of organizing this. So it's kind of hard to like reflect right now on this exhibition or on my experience. I always forget the other half of the question. What was the other half of the That's question? okay. No, I think I, just in terms of personal takeaways and I appreciate that it's really an ongoing process. And I know when I started in the field too, then once you know something you you put out there, whether it's an exhibition or a program, and then people start to engage with it, and then there's all the you know all the levels of learnings and takeaways that come with that. So, right, exactly. Um, we do have um, the person who asked the previous question about framing with curatorial practice um, did add now. Do you create the narrative first and find the works that fit within it? So I'm think, sort of what comes first, maybe is the. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I think it was the other way around first. Brandon like like initially just kind of gave me like a list of artists to go look at and research. And then as time we went on, we just began to like place them where they fit most or who has what similarities. And then from there, we just began writing about it. And then that's how the, I guess that's how the exhibition began to develop into three chapters. 
Great. And I think the following question is very similar. Yeah, do you select works with a theme in mind or do you often see the work first and the narrative naturally forms afterward? So oh, okay. that's the same line. All right. Oh, and um, uh, Mary's uh, recommending, and maybe you're already aware of this, the biography of Ulysses S. Grant by Rob Chernow, Chernow um, who led, mm -hmm, I might say this, this is a longer uh, one to read here. So who led, so Grant led the Union Army in victory over the Confederate Army, ending slavery while he supported his black troops. He crushed the KKK after the Lincoln assassination. He was an honest man who was film blamed by unscrupulous people. The last time we saw this painting, it was an exhibition with Eastman Johnson as an abolitionist. I suggest a broader paintbrush to paint this significant historical figure. What do you think? Hmm. Thank you <laughs> for that question. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think what this question is asking. Yeah, I, with you. Yeah. Is it asking like? Is why? it maybe the yeah the idea of um? Is it getting to the idea of multiple um, perspectives or? And maybe this is something we can come back to when we have our discussion at the end. Yeah. That it might be easier for the um, the yeah. person to uh, share as well. Oh. Off mute. Okay. Um, and then there's another comment regarding Grant. I don't think he pulled Sherman and the army out of the South during his presidency. So let's go to um, Peter asks, how do you think your curating was limited or aided by the collection at MAM? Were there holes in the collection strengths? And I know you mentioned earlier, um, Carrie James Marshall, which I'm so glad we're recording this because yes, we need to acquire, I would love to acquire more work to buy. Yeah, <laughs> that artist. But <laughs> so yeah, if there's anything in your curating that was limited or aided by the collection at MAM, anything else you want to add to that? Um, I did see or like kind of come across a couple holes in the collection. Like I wish there were more Asian American artists represented in the collection because I think that would be like excellent to include some of their works. But yeah, I guess like small holes like that, just like with the demographic that I've kind of ran into and trying to sew like this somewhat like not necessarily all comprehensive narrative American history. So I feel like if I was in that position, like I would feel very like kind of, I don't know, sad that my, that my existence wasn't represented, but I don't know, like, I guess my experience overall was very smooth. I didn't really run into too many bumps besides that. So was the, the other part of the question like something that's aid, aided me in the? Yeah, anything that aided you, where, uh, whether it's strengths or something else that surprised yeah. you about being helpful. <laughs> um, I guess besides like the general aid of like just using TMS while we were still on campus and just having like previous writing writing written by like previous curators, like other than that, like it's just been pretty standard, I would say, like nothing, Nothing stands out too much. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, and for um, those who are with us, yeah, TMS is our collection database. Um, so that is, yeah, ultimately, which is a lot of work is being done now to try to, it has a lot of information in it, but there's a lot more that can be connected to it and made more publicly available. That's a whole nother topic. Uh, <laughs> if some of you have heard about our, our I can't help but always plug uh, the oh. Mellon grant we have that is really about um, the stories we do have around our collection. Uh, being accessible to everyone. And then a project like this that is adding new perspectives and really important narratives um, that simultaneously, those of us who work behind the scenes are like really anxious to make sure it gets captured and contained in the, in, uh, the areas we need so we can pull it back out. But anyway, um, so Aaron asks, can you share more on the process of arriving at the main themes explored through each chapter through conversation, research, et cetera? I would say we arrived at them through conversation and just kind of vocalizing like why we would like to prefer one image in one category than the other. Like, I feel like every time me and Brandon are like meeting or like on the phone, we're kind of going back and forth of why we should move this object. So like we just moved a couple objects like maybe a couple days ago. So it's like constant flux. <laughs> but that's how we mostly did it. We did it through mostly conversations. 